Hey, um, when, when a few of you were asking questions, um, I wrote over here on the board just to remind me, um, I was using the term recovery in, in two different ways, um, and, I, and I wasn't meaning to. Um, back on here just a second. Um, um, just when we were talking about the, the cardiovascular system and recovery, I was using the word recovery in two different contexts. And so can we try to describe these? Because um, I want to describe this one first. Um, when, when you're having a more longer term recovery, let me describe what athletes do to, to test for overtraining or training distress. Um, they always take their first morning's heart rate. Um, it's a common thing. If you take your heart rate one morning and it's 66, the next day it should be 66. It shouldn't vary by more than about 5%. And as someone gets in better and better shape physically, their resting heart rate tends to go down a small amount you know, over, over months and months of training. In other words, your resting heart rate in the morning should be very consistent. If, if it's 72 um, beats per minute one morning and it's 73 the next and it's 74 or 68 or 71 or something like that, that's normal variability. If you wake up one morning and instead of being right around 72, it's 79, that's a sign that you have not recovered from the day before. So you can use heart rate to tell day-to-day -day recovery. And so that's one way you can use heart rate. Um, the other way, when I was talking about the heart rate monitoring, I was meaning much more short-term, like acute recovery. When your heart rate goes up um, above whatever your AT heart rate, whether it's 100 or 120, something like that, allowing it to come back towards resting level. Um, that's heart rate recovery as well. Um, so two contexts using the same sort of biofeedback, um, I think is helpful. So um, I'm sorry, I, I messed this up. I, I quit 15 minutes early. So uh, Elizabeth said, just keep going. So um, <laughs> if I did that in my class, they would have no problem with that. So, <laughs> um, so we mentioned the metabolic system, the cardiovascular system. This last one is actually the shortest of all. And that's um, because it's it's the data that we just started looking at, and there's evidence that um, your breathing is impaired. Um, and it's actually rather sim uh, simple or uh, uh, similar to the uh, cardiovascular system, and there's a diminished ventilatory response to exercise. So um, our, uh, our annual meeting is coming up this October, and um, I've submitted an abstract for this, so I'll get to describe it in more, um, more detail. But the idea is, um, that there's a diminished ventilatory response to activity. In other words, your air exchange doesn't go up as much as you'd expect. That sounds a lot like chronotropic incompetence. The heart rate doesn't go up um, as much as you would expect. So it's a, it's a similar pathology. Less air exchange means oxygen, re uh, uh, CO2, carbon dioxide retention, both in the lungs, in the blood. And if you do a little chemistry, CO2 combines with oxygen excuse me, CO2 combines with water to produce carbonic acid. So carbonic acid, unlike lactic acid, carbonic acid is a very potent acid. It's, a, it's very acidic acid. So that CO2 retention is a problem. Poor oxygenation um, may or may not be a huge issue just because we have um, robust, robust boundaries for that. But then I'm also interested in the, the muscles of respiration, what impact um, that might have. This is what clued me to the, uh, to, uh, the, the ventilatory dysfunction. This is a single patient, and what they did is they did the two-day exercise test. They came in for test one on one day, and then 24 hours later, they did another exercise test. The idea being the first exercise test produces a post-exertional response. The second exercise test measures their capability in that post-exertional state. This is, this is just an abbreviation. Uh, v sub E is, that's expired volume. That's simply how much air they breathe in and out during maximal exercise. So at maximal exercise, this person was breathing 91 liters of air out every minute. Just to give you a perspective, normal would be like 125 to 150 liters. So that's well diminished. But then look at the next day. You would expect this value to be almost exactly the same the next day, and instead it, it goes down as a 13% reduction in ventilation. And that got us kind of going, wow, you know, what's going on with ventilation? How come they're not 
breathing as much as you'd expect. And I'll tell you what a skeptic would say. A skeptic would say they didn't try as hard or they're even more out of shape or something like that. And it's, it's not true in this case because there are ways to detect malingering on an exercise test. You can use criteria to determine if somebody gave maximal effort. And the data I'm going to present at ICFS um, shows that there's this ventilatory dysfunction. So again, if, if that's the problem, how do we move towards uh, a solution? Um, so first of all, recognize this. And I think I've got a, a picture I, I can show on here. It's very colorful, but the muscles that you use to breathe, you have two sets of muscles. You have the diaphragm, and the diaphragm is illustrated here. It's a, a dome-shaped sheet of muscle that goes at the lower part of, of your ribs. When you breathe using your diaphragm, your belly goes out. Okay, and that's a very energy-efficient way to breathe. Because the other way you can breathe, or associate with breathing, is all these muscles that draw the ribs upwards. If you view the ribs as kind of like the shape of a bucket handle, when you, when you pull it upward, it pulls up and out. So your ribs go out when you're breathing. Um, that's, a, that's a much more inefficient way of breathing. And I wonder if these muscles, which are less efficient, have a difficult time being recruited, kind of like the description of your muscles seizing up during activity. The same might be true of the muscles that you use to breathe. And that's why we're seeing some of that ventilatory dysfunction. But regardless, um, what do we do about this? Because that, that CO2 retention, again, CO2 combines with water to produce carbonic acid. That's an acidotic state. That's a very, when people talk about feeling the burn in exercise, that's not lactic acid. Lactic acid doesn't burn. As you guys know, a good white wine has a lot of lactic acid in it. That's why it tastes so mellow. Um, the CO2 that produces carbonic acid is much more acidic, um, and, it, and it increases the the, uh, the need for anaerobic metabolism. Um, oh, so yeah, what about the chemosensitive thing? What stimulates us to breathe are chemosensitive areas throughout the body. There, there's some on the aortic arch, in the carotid sinus, and in the kidney. Those should tell the brainstem breathe more. So. You know, if you hold your breath, the urge to breathe is because of those chemosensitive areas. The only way you could have this blunted response was if those chemosensitive areas become less sensitive. That's the only thing that would allow that. So that's part of that hypothesis. Because um, I'd like to look more at this because if there's a dysfunction in skeletal muscle, it might be the same dysfunction that's pulling those ribs up. Um, and again, the diaphragm is a highly aerobic muscle. Um, thankfully, it doesn't, in normal, um, doesn't fatigue to the same degree. Yeah. So this, talk about the heart, you know, yeah. people with heart problems, there are similarities? Well, um, in terms of the outcome, there's almost exact similarity. The mechanism is very different. The mechanism that allows heart rate to rise is a mixture of the intrinsic activity of the heart from the adrenal gland, the vagus nerve withdrawing its influence, and the sympathetics that innervate the heart increasing their activity. So it's a little bit complicated, whereas to, to like the muscles of respiration, it's simply motor nerves. So in that sense, it's much more simple, yet it, it's describing the same odd phenomena. And, and again, when you have a hard time buying this, you just go, well, it's malingering on the, on the, the subject. And again, on the, the subjects that I've included on here, they reach, the American College of Sports Medicine has criteria for maximal effort. These people are reaching that criteria. So we're comfortable saying they could not have gone much further, yet they still have this diminished capacity. And I think that's fascinating for those of us that are like, something's wrong here. It's, it's a nice objective view that something's wrong. We might not be able to describe it well. That's why I have question marks next to a bunch of stuff, but it's certainly there. Um, and I thought it's not meant to be funny. It's just meant to be, I mean, maybe it's a little comical, but um, it's a fact. So um, what is effective breathing? So if we, if we go back and we recognize that ventilation is diminished, if this seems to be an issue, again, just like the other things we talked about, how can we improve the quality of breathing or utilize breathing? So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to go through two quick things. Diaphragmatic breathing. So diaphragmatic breathing is just basically focusing on using the diaphragm to exchange air rather than incorporating other muscles. Um, and then pursed lip breathing. Both of these might be effective way. 
Most people have heard of diaphragmatic breathing um, as a way to help relax. Like you'll, you'll, you'll see people, they'll put their hands on their belly, they'll breathe in and exhale and relax. Great. Um, it can be a great way for that acute recovery to help occur between bouts of activity. So it's helpful in that way. But just to go back here for a second, diaphragmatic breathing is the least energy cost. So in terms of being able to exchange air with the least amount of energy, it's the best way to breathe because you're not expending energy to draw the ribs up. Um, and, and, and certainly you, you can worry about those muscles atrophying. Um, that may be a secondary issue. But diaphragmatic breathing um, seems to be an effective way to, to help um, have the best uh, energy or uh, oxygen exchange. Um, uh, let's do the abdominal and then we'll do the purse lip. So abdominal, do you guys see on the picture over here? Uh, this woman has her hand over her stomach because you, what you want to have happen is as the diaphragm contracts, it squeezes your guts out of the way. So your, your area right around your belly should rise, but not your chest. So she has her hand on her thoracic cavity here. So that's not going up and down. So you're trying to use the most energy efficient muscles in order to exchange air. So that's abdominal breathing. Highly efficient way to breathe. Um, did anybody play a horn in here? Like a, a woodwind instrument or a horn? It's what your teacher always used to do. You know, use that diaphragm because you're going to be able to play for a much longer time rather than sucking air into your, uh, into your lungs using your thoracic cavity. So take advantage of the, the relaxation effect that it also has, uh, as well as the reduced energy cost of breathing. Um, the pursed lip breathing uh, is interesting. Aside from ME, the people that do pursed lip breathing are people that climb Mount Everest. So one of the things that happens when you climb Mount Everest is there's less oxygen in the air. And so what you do is you breathe in deeply, usually through your nose, but then you breathe out and provide a little bit of back pressure by breathing through, excuse me, pursed lips. That's not the greatest picture, but what that does is it prevents atelectasis. That's where the alveolar sacs tend to collapse just a little bit. It helps to force them open. And then the little bit of back pressure also increases the pressure of air in the lungs. And that, that's what gives the driving force to push oxygen from the alveolar sac onto the blood. So it's, it's an efficient way to, to breathe when you're at altitude. They teach COPD patients to breathe this way or emphysema, even with pneumonia. It's a very effective way um, to breathe, and it can be utilized, especially when you're doing or recovering from an activity. If the ventilation is impaired, get the most you possibly can from the breath that you're taking. So keeping the airways open, that was just the idea of preventing atelectasis at least to a degree. Um, I, I stuck the relaxation on there uh, again because sometimes pursed lip breathing can make you tense up just a little bit because you're breathing out through a, a narrow cavity um, and you wanna still maintain the relaxation that you get with diaphragmatic breathing, but now just incorporating that positive back pressure just a little bit. So that's, especially during recovery, uh, a, a fairly rapid inhale, still trying to use the diaphragm and then out through pursed lips. So you're resisting um, the outflow. There's some fancy things that mountain climbers make to, to help with that but you can do it effectively um, just going through uh, your lips. Um, what, I, what I tried to do when I was going through this kind of stuff is, is link uh, a pathology with what you can do to lessen its effect. Um, there's certainly more than what we've talked about. So the activity monitoring, um, I think the heart rate at the anaerobic threshold is is very, very good way to recognize chronotropic incompetence. I just kind of wanted to go through uh, some of these other things a little bit quickly, but maybe we can spend a little bit more time talking about the exercise therapy. Um, I, I uh, Echo, Echo had a very interesting comment um, when we were talking. She said she was lucky in terms of her treatment of ME because she had a physiotherapy, you guys ready for this? A physiotherapist that listened to her. And one of the, one of the difficulties we have with physical and occupational therapy is they have a mindset of reconditioning, which is really a healthy mindset. You know, most people need reconditioning. The problem is if, if you're not adequately recovering from the type of exercise they're prescribing, something's wrong. Um, and 
And in saying that idea, the exercise therapy that we want to do is something that's restorative, something that builds, um, something that increases your functionality, not something that's frustrating and keeps breaking you down. So we'll, we'll finish up with that. The energy conservation therapy, some of you have, have done this a lot. People talk about your energy envelope, they talk about expanding your energy envelope, or a lot of times ME patients will talk about learning to work within their energy envelope. If you have a diminished energy capability, you decide how you're going to spend that. Um, and I like using the word spend, because if you spend on a credit card, that basically means you've spent more than you have. There's gonna be an interest rate associated with that. And you really don't want the interest rate that's associated with going outside your energy envelope. It's, it's what makes it much more difficult to pay back. Um, I've mentioned a few of these, um, your body positioning um, in terms of cardiovascular um, uh, activities and then some of the stuff, you know, with shopping, bathing, doing your hair, getting around the house and stuff like that. Um, we can spend a little bit more time talking about this exercise therapy. So um, Dr. Snell came up with this word. Um, he's worked with us for many years. Analeptic, that means restorative. So this is exercise therapy that is restorative. Um, the idea being that it's, it's going to be movement that helps you do more with what you're given. Um, so it's an analeptic exercise therapy. Um, we've used this uh, often. Working out doesn't always. So get it, it doesn't always work out. Um, and, and this is what we've seen time and time again with very, very well-meaning exercise physiologists, physical therapists, occupational therapists, um, physiotherapists, trying to do what they were trained in, and to do so well um, with someone that uh, has a damaged aerobic system. Um, one of, the, one of the things you have to be really aware of is what we refer to as this fear factor of activity. Um, and, and sometimes you have probably noticed uh, spending time like pushing further than your capability allow and then you crash. Um, we call that being on an activity roller coaster where you push and crash and push and crash. Um, the times that you're pushing are fun and you get to do things. The time that you're um, having to recover is not such a good thing. And then there's the person who's probably pushed and crashed a lot and realizes that they can avoid the crashes by not pushing. Um, this is a problem, this is a problem. And then trying to, to get away from this fear of activity and, and give patients a sense of ownership and capability and controlling that push crash cycle, I think is important. Um, in the first part, I talked so much about post-exertional malaise, post-exertional post. Um, it's an important part of the, uh, uh, of the pathology and we want to avoid that as much as you possibly can so that you can keep improving. So some guidelines. These are just regular exercise therapy guidelines. Functional movement that's restorative. So functional movement means matching, in, in exercise science they call this specificity. It's matching your training with the desired movements that you want to have. So here you see a, a woman with an exercise band that's, that's building muscles in her hands and gluteals, the lower back, simply straight, strengthening her legs which would allow them to stand up. You, you can't imagine how embarrassing it would be to sit down on the toilet and not be able to stand back up and have to call the EMTs to lift you off of the toilet. So this restorative movement is going to be functional because it serves a very specific purpose, being able to get up out of a chair, being able to move from one position to the next. So any movement that you do, have you guys ever watched people at the gym and they're doing arm curls? And you wonder, why are they doing arm curls? That just has, I mean, other than putting food in your mouth, there's not a lot that uses that small muscle group. So you would, we would want to exercise muscle groups that are tied with the types of movements that you would do um, in life. That's one idea. Training the short-term energy system. Uh, bouts of exercise that are very short will match the energy system that's not impaired in ME. Um, and so it's not shown well here. Um, this happens to be my friend Linda but she would do a, a set of three or four leg extensions, and then she would lay down, put her head on a pillow, put her legs up on a, one of those little Reebok benches, and she would do her diaphragmatic breathing for three or four minutes. Let her heart rate recover completely, not completely, back down towards resting levels. She'd stand back up, do another set. So she started out with one set, she progressed to one set of four, she progressed up to two sets of eight, 
Uh, she found she started having some leg issues when she progressed farther, but certainly that's enough resistance to, to maintain the, the muscles of upper legs, lower back, and uh, glute heels. Same kind of thing is very important for musculature in your upper body, especially for women. You worry about osteoporosis in the, in the spine. Doing something with the shoulder girdles, both pushing and pulling movements, I think are important. Again, trying to, to, to keep the resistance high enough to, to generate the muscle tension, the duration low enough to train that short-term energy system. Uh, and throughout all of these activities, the goal is to improve range of motion or maintain range of motion and functional strength. So I joked about not being able to get off the bathroom, uh, uh, off the toilet. It's happened to my dad a number of times. It's never fun. Um, but the range of motion, I think, is very, very important as well. Uh, I had a graduate student. You could tell exactly how his back was feeling by looking at his shoes. You know, if he had his knot and his shoes right in the center of his foot, no problem bending over. If the knot was way over on one side, you know, you knew he was having a difficulty tying his shoes. When they were completely untied, you know. Was, so there's a lot of movements in life that you take for granted as those start to go away. And so while strength is important, range of motion is particularly important too. This, these kinds of things can be assisted if you have a good OT or, or just a good partner to help you move. Um, that can be beneficial as well. And again, it's the kind of thing you can do lying down um, as well. I probably should have a picture of Linda doing these kind of things recumbent because you can put those through your legs the same way. You can wrap them around your hands the same way. You can push outward if orthostasis is an issue. Um, it might have been a, a better way to illustrate that. Um, focus on quality of life. Um, your focus is not on um, uh, going to run a 5K or things like that. You're trying to match your training to the activities. Um, put here, we keep mentioning, you know, the, the things like uh, washing the dishes, doing gardening, taking a shower, going shopping. All of those kinds of things can be done. It's certainly not a cure. We all want a cure. But um, I was I was telling you the story of my friend when he found out he had um, type 1 diabetes and the doctor patted him on the shoulder and said, don't worry, kid, in five years, they'll have an artificial pancreas. So that was 40 years ago. So it's, this is what we're dealing with is not atypical in medicine. We'd like it to progress much more rapidly than it does. But hopefully we're helping to develop a coping tool that helps with management of the illness. So this is important. If, if I Instead of putting a little bullet by this, we'd put a big star like this, appropriate exercises movement that the patient recovers from. So, and talking about recovery, we're talking about longer term heart rate recovery and avoiding exacerbations of symptoms. Um, for some people, it can be as simple as their glands don't swell up or they, they realize, or, or um, the, the myalgic kinds of pain that they get in their legs or their back or headaches or uh, impaired sleep quality. M remember how we were talking about the symptoms that precede the post-exertional malaise response? You want to pay attention to those so that the activity that you do, you can recover from. Um, so you were, you were talking about the running. I thought that was very interesting. You know exactly how much physical activity you can do, and you kind of know where to draw the line. And he, he came up during the break and asked me, can I push the line a little bit? And, and the answer would be, as long as that movement you can recover from, and then the second one, that it's restorative. Um, so it shouldn't be the kind of thing that you do an activity and have to remove something from your lifestyle in order to allow that. It, you, it should be able to, uh, to um, add to it. So fit program to function, just kind of like we said, recumbent activity versus other activities. Has anyone tried um, aquatic type of therapy before? Um, sometimes that's helpful. Just the hydrostatic pressure, pushing against uh, helps re, you know, with, with venous return of the blood. And just the buoyancy um, is nice. Very, very good for, um, for movement. Um, and hopefully you get enough resistance of the water in there to, to stress the connections on the bones as well. Interesting, yeah. Without paying for it. Without paying for it. That's, there you go, yeah. yeah. Um, the, the, the payback, and that's why I use that credit card example. Um, you, you, want, you want to make sure that you have enough recovery between short bouts of exercise. 
because you may be able to do a bit more without a post-exertional response with shorter bouts of activity, longer bouts of recovery. So like if it's one set of four with a leg press or a, a push-up or something like that, that may take 15 or 20 seconds. The recovery needs to be a couple of minutes, at least a one to three ratio or longer. And you can kind of use your heart rate as a guide. Sometimes when you do the activity, your heart rate response will be delayed and then it'll stay elevated for a while. Wait, that, wait for that to come back down towards resting levels before you start the next one. Um, and, and forget the three sets of 10 thing. Everybody talks about three sets of 10. Um, Charles Atlas just made that up, by the way. It seems to have caught on. But um, one set of four is a really good place to start. Give yourself four or five days of recovery. See how you feel. If you're able to recover from that, try again one set of four. And, and don't forget that you have changes in your lifestyle. So sometimes you'll have good days and bad days calculate that in or at least factor it in when you're trying to decide whether you can add more to that or not. Both delayed onset muscle soreness versus the post-exertional response. Um, I was talking early about uh, some of the walking trials that they had done. They, they had a, a trial where they would had people walking and they added a little bit more walking every couple of weeks or months and they found out that they improved and they published those findings. Walking's great. You know, a CFS patient can walk this much and then this much and then this much. What they failed to do is take into account the amount of physical activity besides the walking that they were removing. So they were doing less and less to accommodate for more and more. That seems to be forgotten, the less and less part, and they, they published the findings on doing more and more. So just keep that in mind, not as an excuse, but working um, within your illness, I think is very, very important. I think I've, I've mentioned this uh, enough. The, uh, the, by the way, this is a picture of Elizabeth's abs. I didn't know if you recognize that. <laughs> but um, she volunteered for that. The, the heart rate really does, does uh, help a lot, the activity biofeedback. Um, it's better than the number of steps or the flights or things like that because it's much more acute. You don't have to wait till the end of the day to look back at how much activity you did. And it's, it's much more dynamic. It's gonna tell you when you're exceeding your AT and for how long and allow you a measure to um, come back. The energy conservation is all about pacing, short duration activity, plenty of rest breaks. Balance the activities you wanna do by planning to rest and recovery. Who is, oh, uh, Echo again, it was you. Talking about doing your hair. You know, you can do it all in one, it looks very nice by the way, one bout of activity that you may have to pay back or you can do it in shorter bursts with recovery, still gets done, it might take longer, but you don't have that post-exertional response. That's an example of doing more with less or fitting more into your life. Um, uh, and then, uh, of course, you know, all of the other requirements. It seems oftentimes that middle-aged women or just women in particular are afflicted with ME. And um, in terms of trying to balance their activities, between taking care of children, spouse, houses, and things like that, oftentimes they rank seven or eight in order of importance. And, and sometimes you get horrible exacerbations of the illness because they feel like they have the primary responsibility for the children. And um, I, I'm not saying that's, that's easy. I'm just a husband. I'm the one that gets taken care of. Um, but in, in terms of uh, balancing that activity, I think it can be a challenge. Um, I, I found it very, very refreshing that the CCDP were planning activities to do with the rest of the family, um, the, the spouses, the partners, the friends um, that, that help out the people with MECFS. They need support too. They need understanding. I told them the story. Um, oftentimes we would have volunteers come in to do the study. They would, uh, it, we had just women in the study. So oftentimes they had their boyfriends, their fathers, their husbands. As soon as they went back to do the testing, I was left with them and they'd turn around and look at me and say something like, is this real? You know, is, is, what's going on? Is this in her head and things like that? And so we have to recognize that was the person in her life that was the closest to her and he was skeptical. Um, and so I think you just have to recognize that there's some skeptic, some, there's skepticism with the illness even among those closest to him. And when you can get buy-in from that person, um, like refreshingly I've seen with both Larry and Elizabeth with their children, um, you, can, you can help them listen to their watch, you can help them with their activity and, and care providing and things like that. So 
Um, exercise does work out. Um, we have we've, we've a lot of case studies. Um, this is, again, this is Stacy Stevens, by the way, the one that's, that's working with Linda there. Um, she's worked with a lot of patients. She works with most of them over the phone or online with activities. Um, it certainly helps give you a sense of control over your illness. You know what causes the post-exertional response. You have some measure of control over that. I think that's healthy because it's empowering, especially when oftentimes you feel so helpless at the, uh, um, the effects of the disease. It's a quality of life issue, sense of control. Um, when I showed that, uh, that activity avoider versus the push crash cycle, sometimes it can help ameliorate both ends of that spectrum so that they live a more healthy um, lifestyle. And again, matching the activity to what you're capable of doing, again, like you'd mentioned with the running, trying to progress gently, matching the, the fitness level, the desired fitness to what it is you enjoy doing in life. It's probably not going to be backpacking or long distance running, but certainly, and it may not be a marathon at the mall either, but it, it could be a period of time when you can get to the shopping center, enjoy shopping for a measure of time with appropriate rest breaks and come back without having to pay for it for days um, at a time. So I just want to finish with this because this is kind of a, a staged program. We start out in stage one and you make sure that someone can do all parts of this activity without any exacerbation. In other words, they get very in tune with their own biofeedback. They're able to rank, rate their letter, letter, rating of perceived exertion. They're staying within their energy envelope. They're not having significant exacerbations. They're using their heart rate and that's oriented primarily towards uh, full body movement and strengthening of the large muscle groups, kind of like the resistance bands. Um, you can use body weight that makes an outstanding resistance. Um, you can use hand weights, um, all oriented towards large muscle strengthening type workouts. Um, this is the type of activity, when you, when you think of resistance training, this would fall under that category of strength training. Um, lift a fair amount, recover for a long period of time. You know, some people, when they do weight training, they, they do back-to-back -back sets and lighter weights with high repetition. This is more analogous to strength training. Lower repetitions, more emphasis on weight, and then long recovery. So that recovery is very, very important. Use the heart rate monitor while you're doing that. Um, this is a more passive sort of thing in stage one. A lot of times we'll have a, a therapist provide the resistance. As you move into stage two, we'll have other, like, like I mentioned with body weight resistance bands um, and dumbbells and things like that to provide the resistance. And then as you progress, sometimes this can take months uh, or even a year to get through stage one and two. And then stage three, we call this dose controlled interval training. And the only reason we've used interval training in here is to avoid the word aerobic, but the interval can start to become longer. Um, and as you make that interval longer, you rely more and more on aerobic metabolism. If you have an aerobic limitation, the dose needs to be limited. So dose controlled interval training stays within the capability so that that's not exceeded and produces a post-exertional response. Um, oftentimes patients will report, this is going great. I feel like I'm just getting into it and I can progress so much further. Oftentimes that's the point where you draw a line and say you're at a good point for maintenance. Um, because in different aspects where they try to progress further, they end up exacerbating symptoms. Um, and that's, that's a symptom-limited bout of exercise. Again, one that's restorative. Um, and, and always trying to orient, minimizing the post-exertional response, maximizing what somebody is actually capable of doing. So uh, it's, it's not, this isn't a proscribed program. This is something that would be highly individualized. So, yes? And then when I 
Yeah, so the first part of the question is essentially what symptoms do you pay attention to that, that would produce an exacerbation? And I think that falls under a variety of different categories. Um, a lot of times it's immune related, you know, so you'll, you'll notice uh, fever, hot and cold flashes, headache, um, pain, but then swollen glands, um, sometimes dry mouth kind of things, um, more related to the immune system. You know, I think the two best would be swollen glands um, and then like fever chills and things like that and then there's a variety of immunological excuse me uh, like neuroendocrine kind of problems that are more associated with i have much more of the orthostasis a lot more brain fog uh, or then just musculoskeletal a lot more fibromyalgia kind of pain um, especially in the joints that are being utilized which one of those describes you the best your exercise bout shouldn't exacerbate those to a large degree. And I, and I realize there's, there, there must be some baseline symptoms, but you want to avoid exacerbating those so they're not amplified. Right, I guess the question was more like, should we reduce? Um, well, and that's, that goes back to that one of those early slides. How do you recover? Intense, uh, oh, the very first slide. How do you recover? Intense rest. I mean, the rest is important, but you, but you need the activity to help from losing function. So I do think the rest is important, but in terms of resting enough to diminish symptoms, I would just worry about not having some overload on the system to keep it from diminishing even further. So it would, it would be nice if you could do activity, like a lot of people experience um, alleviation of secondary depression when they're able to do some physical activity. You know, so, so that symptom may get better, but they have to pay attention to other symptoms that could be exacerbated by doing too much. Yeah, I, I think the latter portion, um, one thing that defines or describes the illness is the waxing and waning of symptoms. So I, that's something that we're always going to experience. The question is, does adding physical activity cause those to amplify even more? I don't, I don't know where you'd average. Can I just ask the group? I mean, are there symptoms that you're sensitive to where you know you've overdone it? What are those? Yeah. Uh, okay, lightheadedness, na nausea from hypoglycemia, shaky. Anybody else? Pain. Balance, vertigo, dizziness. Uh, even worsening of the fatigue. The fog is one of the first signs for me. Brain fog, cognitive decline. It's just loopy. What? Yeah. Clumsiness? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, uh, oh, not more than clumsiness, just. No, I think, I think there's times where all of this exercise, training, stuff, pacing just goes out the window because you're so sick. Um, and I think almost everybody that's had ME for a while, they'll describe a period of time that was just dark. It was bad. Um, just getting to the doctor and trying to treat symptoms was the main idea. Just 
getting through a day. This is the kind of thing that you become more concerned with when you've got your symptoms a little bit more contained, feeling better about management of the illness. Um, so that, so that it becomes a concern. Um, almost everybody I've dealt with, they have a period of time where exercise is off the radar completely because they're dealing with symptoms. Um, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't even go there just because you're not feeling well enough to do much of anything. And that's, and that's where priority one becomes treating symptoms um, and alleviating that as much as you possibly can to be able to tolerate this. Um, if you, if you, the worrisome is you'd add this on top of it and exacerbate even more with anything that you did. The, uh, am, I, am I hurting myself? I, I consider myself. Let's, let's just, con maybe let's consider it this way. Um, can I tell you a silly story? When I went to my undergrad, I was pre-med, and then I decided to go get my master's in exercise science. And my grandmother said, exercise science, what's that? And I said, Grandma, that's, that's what you, you know, it, uh, tests, you know, how, how, your, how your body adapts and responds to exercise. And she looked at me and said, well, whenever I feel like exercising, I just lay down until the feeling goes away. <laughs> so, I, and the only reason I say that is because you think, why did we, as, why did we North Americans start talking about exercise? Because people died of cardiovascular disease, stroke, and hypokinetic related cancers. Those were the leading causes of, besides smoking and things like that. But lack of physical activity industrial revolution, all that kind of stuff. So we have all been indoctrinated with the way you stay healthy is to do aerobic activity. You walk, you jog, you go on a stair climber or something like that. Um, we all, and, and even, even after all these years, you're still measuring your fitness on an aerobic scale. And what I'm hoping we can learn to do is get rid of that aerobic indoctrination and say, stretching and strengthening functionality kinds of movements are going to be what I can build on to improve my life. Um, and what I'm, I, I realize what you're abandoning there is the capability to go up one row and down the next to go shopping or clothes shopping or go to an amusement park or anything like that. Um, but it's just, it's less productive than trying to train the anaerobic system where you learn to do little dose-controlled bouts of activity throughout your day. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sometimes that might fit into your energy envelope, uh, and other times it might not. Um, I, I have this little thing outside my office that says exercise is good for you because it's bad for you. Because, I mean, when you think about some of what exercise does for you, it's damaging. But the part that's not on there is you can heal from that damage. And your question, the answer to your question is, are you doing damage that your body can heal to improve? Or is it doing damage that takes you downward and, and hopefully... You're, you're improving. If you're not improving, then it's probably not productive. Well, and been times when I was able to so maybe maybe you're at Rarely, that stage. Minutes, yeah, very, very. that that your goal is to try to maintain that, mm -hmm. um, which is which is again, you know, going back to that example of someone that's trying to lose weight. Step one, stop gaining. You know, and, and that's actually, that's a good goal if, if you can maintain what you have. That you have to recognize that as something that, okay, I, I can deal with that.
Yes. I have a question, and I know I know that you don't. Um, you already said that you didn't deal with people who were uh, uh, housebound or, yeah. or bedbound, but uh, the idea that mm, the choices are between crashing and burning or being fearful, and that somewhere in the middle there is some ability to make your way out. It's, um, it's difficult to see how to do that. I mean, I see my daughter who was a dancer, very disciplined, very conscious of her body, very aware of uh, the limitations, much more so than anyone I know. And I see her trying to walk that line. And when Stacy was here last year, she was talking about well, you know, forget about exercise at that level, you know, just doing an activity that's useful to you, whether it be having a shower or just something that brings you joy or whatever that should be, you know, what you go for. At some point, though, you don't know, there's this, there's this confusion I see that she has and that I have and I don't know how to encourage her, where how do I know that she's heading, or how does she know, how does anyone know that they're heading towards the crashing and burning or being too fearful? And that struggle is stressful. I think that to me, when I see the level of um, pacing, what pacing means, it's such an innocuous word. You imagine somebody calmly walking along in the sunshine. But pacing is this intense, like, maddening thing. What the hell have I gone too far? Am I going too little? What is it? It's, there's no indicator. And with a heart rate monitor, it may or may not tell you something. You don't even know if it is when that little beeper goes off. Have you gone too far? Have you not gone too far? Have you got the right measurement? Is your POTS affecting you? I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to ask is, how do you know any of it when you don't have a clear objective marker and you don't know what the price is you're going to pay? The question that was asked now was, is it dangerous to push yourself too far? Now, if you're going to have a crash of one or two days, well, maybe you might decide that that's worthwhile. But at the end of the day, how do you know when you're causing too much damage by too much deconditioning or too much pushing? Can I embrace the question? <laughs> you know, I, 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 that's, that's a cheesy thing to say. I'm, I'm trying to think of the, the, the physiology that goes along with the exceeding... The guy, you know, there's there's a lot of examples, marathon runners suffering from kidney failure and the gut translocation stuff. The, the fact is, in those dire circumstances, they are able to recover. And um, I think that's always the line you're looking at trying to draw. What activity can your daughter recover from? And, and that's what defines it. Um, and just, I keep using the, uh, the weight loss example, you know, if you look somebody in the eye that say, I want to lose weight. And you go, well, just eat less and exercise. It sounds like it's so simple. Just pace, you know, when in reality, it's, it's a day-to-day -day struggle. Um, it's very, very difficult to do. Um, is it worth it? I think so, yeah. I, I think it improves quality of life. Is trying to progress and do physical activity worth it? Yes, as long as it's restorative, empowering, and that it improves function, not when it's going the other way. Um, and that's, that's not even an answer to your question, because you're talking about where the line is. I'm, I'm talking about if you can find the line, it's helpful. I mean, be, before we go on, does, does anybody have a better answer to that? Wants to chime in on it? Go ahead.
terrible dilemma of this. It's that you have to be comfortable and happy where you are, but keep hoping and up in the quagmire. That is what's so hard. No, that was that was like the cheerleader, uh, I, you know, it's just, which I think we all need, you know, and that's the beauty of having a support group to keep doing that amongst each other. Yeah, I think I think the the post exertional response when you do too much is is very noticeable. The 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 long, slow, gradual decline when you do too little is much gentler and insidious. So I think they're both bad. One's one's much more noticeable than the other. Right. No. Which, which in itself is helpful. Yes, up and up. I agree with you. I think down here it was saying that you can't really tell. I think it's always a, a moving target between dead doing The question is when you're starting to, you're talking about that diminished capacity of breathing. That can exacerbate when we sleep. I my back. Uh, I, it possible. Um, it, it's it's the the more worrisome part with sleep apnea is the accumulation of CO two. You know the uh, when you think about the moment to moment uh, stimulation of breathing, it's primarily CO two and pH. The more long term is mediated by O two. Um, so the headache might actually be due to the acute effects of accumulation of CO two hypercapnia rather than hypoxia. Um, but I don't know how changing position would do that other than just to facilitate. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's sort of odd what that sounds like is when someone has altitude sickness, they want to sit down and lay down for the headache to go away and it actually it's beneficial to move, to stimulate breathing. Um, that's for altitude, and that's, that's due to low O2. Um, I, wonder, I wonder if the same phenomenon is occurring. What you could try is when you feel the headache coming on and you want to stay in bed, practice the diaphragmatic breathing with the pursed lips, see if it alleviates the headache. Um, something to try anyways. Um, hey, can I, can I finish with this? I just want, I want us... To, to notice, and this is this is not directed towards you too, even it is. I'm supposed to be talking to the choir here, you, you know, like everybody on board, but then, and, and this is not a criticism, please don't take it like this. We keep talking about aerobic activity, and that's because it's so deeply ingrained. It's the measure of our fitness. It's the measure of how much we can do. Damn it, we're not going to die of cardiovascular disease. Um, but then everything we've talked about here and the examples I'm using of improvement, um, are strength-based, whereas the marathon runner, you know, I use that as an example, kind of going downward. So keep trying to reframe our view of what's going to be restorative activity, getting away from that aerobic base. Um, that's just an example up there. 
is um, the, the woman I told you about that wanted to get up her three flights of stairs and develop more strength. Um, it, there, there are times when it really does work out well. Um, and again, this is obviously a higher functioning um, MECFS, but th here's some of the, you know, she feels stronger, more flexible, able to get around a bit better. Um, that's three months after an additional two months, I'm able to get out and accomplish um, tasks without a significant relapse. So there, there are a lot of nice case examples where it does um, work. And again, just trying to emphasize the matching, the activity, the exercise, the analeptic exercise to a functional activity that you want to do, I think is really good. And through the whole thing, trying to avoid putting too much stress on the aerobic system that produces um, relapses. So uh, that's all I said was a traditional approach with aerobic exercise and in my opinion doesn't work very well. So try to try to keep training ourselves towards things that might be more productive. What about I depends we, interestingly enough at, at the International Association of MECFS we have a nice group of aerobics instructors that have been coming. They want to understand the illness and it just depends on the type of yoga that you do. Um, and, and all it really takes is a pose, recover, 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 recover. Then another pose, and, and, and they're finding a lot of MECFS patients. They love coming to their classes. They feel like they can do it. Oftentimes it's horizontal, at least the recovery part is. And interestingly enough, it really matches. I've never, I, before we came up with this program, I never tried yoga before, but inadvertently they're, they're finding what works for them is similar to what we're doing yoga -less, but that's the idea. So yes, definitely. No, 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 certainly. Well, the, the problem with the, the temperature thing is just like a sauna or a, you know, it's the vasodilation to the skin that exacerbates the, uh, the hypotension and orthostasis and stuff. Can we, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Sort of bonus, I suppose. Uh, the answer is definitely yes. They focus on training their anaerobic system, and their aerobic system does improve. Uh, yes. And I don't even like to tell the story because then people are like, well, then I can improve my aerobic system too. It's it's not a hugely meaningful in terms of, you know, uh, statistically significant, but it is clinically relevant. So yes. And the opposite is true. You know, most people that do aerobic end up with benefits to their anaerobic system as well. So that's not surprising, but it does happen, yes. Um, and we can see it with the, ox the VO2 test as well. Yeah. Have a comment? I don't know. Um, the one thing we have tried to do is look at illness duration, you know, to see if there's a difference. We just don't have enough people to do it. Um, all of us, I think, at one time or another have talked about uh, ways to classify patients. That would be a very interesting way to classify. I've just, honestly, I've never asked the question before. I hadn't thought about it. So be interesting. It seems to me, just when you talk with patients, 
the, the people who tend to get this illness were pretty go-getters before the illness. I mean, definitely type A plus, um, motivated, long hours, hard work, driven, maybe even compulsive. That, that, and, and for that type of person, it's a very difficult disease to have. But I don't, I don't know the answer to your question. Interesting. One more? It probably does. I've never thought of it that way. You guys get his question, you know, the, the, the activity to rest ratio probably does. I was sharing with, uh, with Larry, I wrote uh, a series of grants with a woman that has an ME and it was very interesting when she'd come to my office and sit in the desk next to me, she was, she was after 45 minutes, she was just messed up, loopy, you know, got to go to my car and take a break. Um, we moved down to the lab and she would lay on a, on a cot with the laptop. She was good for hours. And every once in a while, she just, you know, put her head back, breathe deeply, stay recumbent, back at it. For hours. I mean, the, the, the difference between simply being upright and horizontal is dramatic. And, and probably, the, the answer to your question is probably the little mental breaks that she took as well were just as important as the physical ones. So, interesting. Well, Larry, you got it? Hey, you guys, thank you for coming. It's really fun to, to be able to share our research um, with you and, uh, and to be able to listen to you guys too. Thank you.